How would you like to have a seven figure business that is built with the use of virtual assistants? On this episode, we'll hit on the action steps to do just that. I'm Devin Hers. Welcome to the DMC Marketing Nugget. It is time to go underground. We have underground serial entrepreneur, investor, outsourcing expert, father, husband, and owner of Level 9 Virtual. Welcome, Joe Rare. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's, uh, it's good to speak with you. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot about virtual assistants this day and age, You're getting tons of messages about them, but I know you really have this locked in. Uh, before we get started, I'd love to know a little bit more about you. How did you uh, get into this whole virtual assistant world and your background? Yeah, so gosh, the virtual assistant thing started uh, four hour work week back in 2007 ish when that book came out. And uh, spent a lot of time, you know, trying to decide what I was going to do next after I kind of got my butt kicked in the real estate industry. Um, you know, in 2008, kind of came to an end, and uh, we lost pretty much everything in real estate at the time. Um, I was in my mid to late 20s, and um, I guess mid 20s at that point. And so, I, you know, I'd read the Four Hour Work Week, decided, hey, this sounds like a good idea. I'm going to build one of these businesses. Um, I sat down at my kitchen table. I uh, built an entire e-commerce business following literally the book page by page and um, started using virtual assistants. So I hired my first VA in November of 2008. Um, I've tried every country imaginable that you can think of from India and Pakistan to Sri Lanka and Vietnam and um, down in Australia, Canada, the UK, everywhere. Um, and then I, I landed in the Philippines with uh, the team that I actually decided to grow with. Um, kind of hit a home run, did really, really well with the first e-commerce business. Um, that went great for a period of time. And then everybody kept asking me, how do you, how do you get clients? How do you know how to market? How do you run your ads? And so I started doing some consulting. I landed a deal to do some work with um, Keller Williams in one of their coaching programs uh, down in Texas. And so I got to work with them quite a bit. And then from there, I built an agency. Uh, let's see, the, the ugly, dirty story of the agency was... All things were going well until they weren't going well. And, um, you know, the VA guy who had had a VA every single day of my life decided that I was going to start hiring people local, um, got a big office space with glass doors and walls and thought that was fancy. Um, got a big, uh, you know, conference room thinking that clients were going to come and, and visit us and nobody ever came. And, um, you know, the business was going fine until it wasn't. And we lost a few key clients. Uh, we started bleeding cash like crazy. And then um, a mentor of mine said, hey, you should probably close your agency down. And uh, I was like, well, I don't know about that. And um, at the time, he had kind of explained he'd been through a similar situation. He uh, had lost his you know, business, but he'd restarted. He had a small team, mainly outsourced. He was doing like $60,000 a month and he was making money and having free time. And here I was, you know, 27 U.S. employees, all in a very expensive building, bleeding cash like crazy. I decided not to listen to him and um, just keep racking up debt, trying to pay payroll. Uh, about eight months later, I saw him on an interview and he went from 60,000 to 400,000 a month. And I thought, shit, he's doing something right. So I texted him and I just said, hey man, what, do, what did you do? How'd you get there? And he, all he said back was, uh, you obviously didn't listen to me, did you? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> so I can't remember if it was a day or two days later, but I ended up firing everybody in the company, uh, closed it down dealt with getting out of the lease and that whole rigmarole, um, put back to the VA structure, put virtual assistants in place to work on fulfillment and work on uh, prospecting to help me generate new business. Uh, they took over and, and ran that part. We went from zero to $109,000 a month in revenue in four months. Uh, after four more months, we doubled again, but, and I was able to pay off every dollar of debt that I had. Um, which was just over a quarter of a million dollars um, that we had racked up. And then I realized, hey, if I could do this in this business, why don't I just do the same thing in, the, in my virtual assistant business? 
And so we did that scaled and it's, uh, it just has exploded from there. That's, that's incredible. And I think as we're, we're younger, we think bigger is always better. Um, but we know that bigger <laughs> overhead is not always better. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, man, uh, you can definitely tie idea. you down if you have that kind of overhead. Yeah, it's, it's tough to, to have that balance. We want to have these beautiful buildings. So uh, my story is kind of similar to that as well, as far as just trying to have a big building, printing presses and whatnot. And, you know, when it's going good, it's great, but things happen quickly in this world. So you have to be able yeah. to be agile. So um, we also wear many, many hats as business owners. Uh, we deal with the, the problems of just running a business, um, the employees, the staff, the clients, all these different areas to focus on how do you really help solve and eliminate some of those hats that a business owner has to wear? Well, one of the challenges is most people get into building a business for freedom, right? They have this grand idea that I'm going to build a company. I'm going to be able to kind of work whenever I want and do what I want. Um, and most people never achieve that. And it's partly because they are unwilling or they don't, they lack the knowledge on how to delegate. And delegation is difficult. Um, you know, when you built something, it's your baby and it's your money that's coming in. And like, I have to give some of this to somebody else. If they mess it up, like that hurts my family. It's challenging for a lot of people. And you know, it, Hey, if I want it done right, do it myself. Right. And I yeah, think absolutely. even with the resources and the knowledge that people can go gain, people still live in that. And we do that around our house with projects around our homes and we do it in our business so much. And, so the first thing is, is, is being willing to let go a little bit. And so for me, one of the first things that I have people do is I'm like, get, get what, what I call a get shit done VA, right? Just a utility nice. player. Somebody who could come in and every time that you sit down at your desk, you're like, oh my gosh, I got this to do, that to do, that to do, that to do, that to do. Start taking those little things and give them to somebody else and realize you may only get a 60% positive output on the first run of these things, but they're being handled. So now you started with that. Now what you did is you flexed that delegation muscle. You learn how to actually get something off your plate, whether it's completely trivial and, and not valuable, um, but you started that practice. And once you get it down, it becomes an addiction. And now all of a sudden okay. it's like, well, hold on, I wanna get this other thing off my plate. I wanna get that other thing off my plate. I want the next thing off. And the more that you do it, you just get better at it then you can start to tackle real things in your business. And so from a business standpoint, I always step back and go, as an owner of a company, what's my job? My job is to build the business and create money, right? If the, if the business yep. isn't making any yep. money, it doesn't matter how, many, how much stuff I delegate, I don't have any money to pay people. So generating revenue is the, the key of what my responsibility is. So everything that's non-revenue generating, somebody else needs to be able to handle it. And that's the, the beginning point where we actually build teams. Already laying down the good nuggets here. So let's go ahead and jump into the four action items. And I think you hit on some of them here, uh, just in that cool. quick overview. What's really that first step when considering hiring a virtual assistant that you look for? So what I would do is sit down and decide all of the little things that you could get off your plate that are not worth your time. And so that is something that as a business owner, you better be able to realize how much your time is worth. So for me, I don't think that anything under a hundred dollar an hour task is worth me even looking at. And some people, maybe it's 20 bucks an hour. Some people, maybe it's 50 bucks an hour, whatever it is that, you know, I, I mean, my wife's a stay at home mother. Um, she doesn't clean our house because her time is better spent with our kids. It's better spent with, you know, doing projects. It's better spent doing other things for the household. So paying somebody else to clean our house makes a lot of sense financially and value add for our family. Same right. thing in your business. So pick, pick those things that are not worth your time. Get somebody else to start doing them again. Start with that utility player. I think that's a big one that somebody who's just kind of like a general VA, they can come in and they can knock down a few of your tasks. That's the first right. place that I would start. The second uh, piece of that, of that one area is going to be, well, what do I have to, you know, uh, I have all this knowledge in my head about my business. So we have to get mm -hmm. it out. So as soon as you can start to get that stuff out, then you can move forward, putting some team members in place, but the tribal knowledge you have in your head, you've got to get it out. 
I love oh, that. And that. I think, you know, having, yeah. having, having those systems and, and having that, I think for business owners to take a step back from their business on a regular basis to look at these types of things and what you can delegate out to save time. People are always thinking ROI is in the form of dollars coming in. I look at it as how much time oh, can we save to allocate to things that are going to really generate ROI. So, yeah, there's there's a huge um, misunderstanding of you know ROI in business. Some of the you know so so in the winter I've been blessed to be able to actually snowmobile like five days a week if I wanted, and in the winter like that's my my thing. What's very interesting though is that I get so much business done when I'm on a mountain, I'm riding a snowmobile, nobody's talking to me, but me, I'm talking to myself. And the amount of actual thought that I get done, the amount of planning I can get done in my head while I'm out doing things in nature, you know, in the, in the summer, it's something different, but, but that time yeah. to think. And what I know is that when I come back, everything else is being handled by my team. We got it. They got it. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. I get the headspace to actually think and then go, okay, well, what do we need to do to grow? What do we need to do to, you know, to acquire another company or whatever it is that our, our plans are going to be. Right. Yeah. I think taking that time is so crucial. And, and I think you, when you have that right team behind you, you have that confidence that you can go out and do those things. And it's not just to get away from yeah. life and business. We're actually thinking about business out there and we're coming back even more That's level it. headed and clear minded. Yeah. Um, right. So when yeah. you mentioned at the beginning of the show that you can choose all these different countries, how do you go about finding the right person, the right team that's a good fit for you? So the way that I landed, you know, we use the Philippines more than any other country. We have some in South America as well. Um, it depends on the role okay. that you're trying to fill for. But one of the areas that worked really, really well as far as, you know, me being in the U.S., and I know you probably have uh, people who see this from all over the world, but the Philippines were an interesting choice because, uh, you know, if you have somebody do a design task, as an example, we ran into a lot of challenges in other Asian countries because their design style didn't match the U S style, right. And on how we, we design things as an example, um, in the Philippines, they, you know, their street signs are in English universities teach in English. It's their second language. They wear our clothes, they listen to our music and they watch our movies. They, they follow, you know, I get on calls and, and we, we meet team members and stuff and they'll be wearing like a New York Yankees hat. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're so far from New York. You're not a Yankees fan. I know that, but you know what I mean? And it was like, and, and that was a, like a really, really strong point for, for me to realize, Hey, this is the right culture for the things that we need because they follow the U S culture. Right? So our pop culture is their pop culture for a lot of things. That was a big deal because we could have conversations and they understood exactly what we were talking about. And so that's where I would start is, we, is understanding, can you find those cultural similarities that actually match? But then also it comes down to, you know, what role are you trying to fill? Now, a Filipino is not a very aggressive, you know, culture. So we use people in South America for things that are more aggressive, like sales and outbound calling and things like that. Okay. So realize the role you're trying to fill and then find the personality match to fit it. That's that's great. And I uh, one of our team members is based out of the Philippines and I crack up because uh, when she writes me back a message, her English is better than mine. So it's, uh, you know, I think you need to just get through those fears of what's out there and know that, hey, for certain yeah. needs, I mean, our core team is based here in the US um, for the main tasks that we do on a regular basis. But being able to have team members that understand, like you're saying, can speak, can write and understand the look and feel of the design work that we're doing is crucial to us. Um, so how are you seeing right yeah. now with companies best leveraging remote work and virtual assistance for growth these days? Um, I mean, it's, it's becoming a higher and higher demand as the economy starts to, um, I guess, come to a halt. <laughs> that's what, that's, what's happening. I'm not really sure what we're going to call it. Uh, I think everybody's looking, how can we, how can we create leverage and cost? Um, which, you know, if you look at just what's happening, you know, we can use the U S as an example. You look at what's happening as far as, you know, just the, the value of the dollar and spending power and, and, um, labor power, what you can afford it's very, you know, the leverage is in the discount that you can get by going overseas. That's the first piece of it. The second piece of it though, is okay. understanding that you can actually hire more qualified people in another country for far less 
you can actually afford to get somebody who's exceptional with the dollar cut, you know, the dollar leverage, you know, moving to another country. So that's one of the big ways that they're using it. Now all of a sudden you go, well, I can get, I can get one person here for X price, or I can go get three right. somewhere else at a, at, you know, a discount. Um, even though they may have the same, same skill set and same experience, that opportunity for you to grow. Hundred hundred percent. I, I think you know people think of virtual assistants that they're just learning from a book. Or the, these are very well educated people that have some yeah. mad skills out there that are available. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's just you know keep that open mind. Look and see what you can move around in your business to bring in a virtual assistant. I think is is crucial. Um, being in the grind day in and day out, I would say it takes a toll on your life. Uh, how does your solution and and working with VAs really helps some of that work-life balance? Well, I mean, you get so much off your plate, number one. So the, the challenge with business owners, right, is the, the hustle mentality. Let's all work yeah. 15 hours a day, right? And, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of guys out there who tell you that that's, that's, the, that's the best way to get there. For me, it's never been. I know that the reason that I built my business has a very specific goal, and it's time. It's time freedom. Yes, I want the financial freedom, but once you hit a certain level of, of income, finances don't really play that much bigger of a role as you, as you grow. Time becomes the asset. And as you really start to understand that, you know, if I could take a team and realize that to replicate myself is gonna be exceptionally challenging. But what, what I could do is I could hire four people who are basically 40% as good as I am and now all of a sudden you have 160 percent of me not nice. bad i'll take that right and so yeah. um it, there's an interesting way of creating leverage by hiring multiple people to take a lot of those roles and so all of a sudden i can replace myself it may take two or three but i can replace a lot of what i do and so then that creates my work-life balance so i always tell people i have a different philosophy around this than most people do i've already built the business that i worked 20 hours a day and bled through my eyes and did all of this, you know, and, and had this debt and had all that weighing on me so that even oh. the four hours I was supposed to be sleeping, I wasn't sleeping. Um, it was, it was a really, really challenging time in life. And I realized that I don't have to, I don't have to do that. You know, I could put other people in place that could, uh, support my business. And then what I, really got down to and probably the biggest nugget takeaway that I think I ever say on any podcast I get interviewed on is reverse engineer your business. So I don't get okay. into a business opportunity with the idea of the business opportunity. I first go, Hey, is this going to give me the lifestyle output I want? If this is not going to let me have the lifestyle I want, I don't touch it. And so there might be, a, you know, we, we've got a little bit of financial resources, so I'm not, you know, maybe I'm in a little bit better place when it comes to that but you can still leverage VAs, create a good, you know, a good team and make it so that you have the freedom, the time freedom to do everything that you want to do and only get involved and say yes to things and clients that are going to allow you to continue to have that lifestyle. And you can still make an exceptional amount of money. And so like my biggest nugget that I always tell people is I say, design your business around your lifestyle. Don't do the opposite because you'll get stuck in your business. You'll never get freedom and you'll always find more stuff to do. hundred percent. I think these are, are crucial nuggets and I think it's a mindset, whether you're just launching a business or have a already successful business. And if it's just even partial components of what you're outsourcing to save you and your team time on some of these medial tasks, it, it just can catapult your business altogether. I know it's really helped us grow. I'm looking forward to learning more from you, Joe, because I think there's always systems that can be improved on a regular basis. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge and providing us with these great nuggets. Uh, how does someone go about getting in contact with you and finding out more about what you got to offer? Yeah, so uh, level the number nine virtual.com, um, or you can just go find Joe Rare um, on YouTube or wherever the heck I might be. Um, reach out. Like, I, you know, I actually, if, if it's not my VA answering my DMs, I, I will try to hop in and, and answer them too. Um, but every message gets to me at some point. So, okay. whether, you know, it's my VA answering my emails, um, you know, you can reach me at joe at level nine virtual.com um, or just hit the website, book a call, and 
anybody can help you from there. Good stuff, Joe. Um, well, if you guys are out there and you're ready to get more done, save time, increase profits, check out level9virtual.com. Thanks again, Joe. Really appreciate your time, man. You got it. Thank you. All right. That wraps up another great DMC marketing nugget. Go ahead and smash that like and follow button. Listen on your favorite streaming apps and visit dmcmarketingnugget.com to watch all of our episodes. Here's to your success.